Well, thank you very much, John, for those uh, generous remarks. Um, I need to begin by giving the warmest possible congratulations to uh, Tom and Marla and Jean for an outstandingly good conference. Um, it's been outstanding in a number of ways. I'll say just a bit about those in a moment. Uh, but I doubt that there's a single person in this audience who will go home uh, with no new ideas, concepts, or findings. Uh, we're a diverse group. Uh, it's a frightening group to talk to because they're more or less Everybody's a world leader in one way or another, but that's been the interest. So why has it been such a high-level conference? Well, firstly, it's top-level innovative science. Uh, that was abundantly clear uh, throughout the uh, papers. It was curiosity-driven. Um, it was conceptual and approach and forward-looking. Uh, almost none of the papers uh, failed to end without uh, looking ahead as to what needed to be done next. It's very interdisciplinary, uh, very collaborative. It's quite striking how many of the uh, presentations reflected people working together who would never have worked together uh, without EBBD uh, having been there. Um, and. Also, particularly for the audience of the sort we have, uh, very clearly expressed in mainly non-technical language. Uh, that's not easy to do with complex science, and uh, most speakers uh, achieve that uh, at a very high level. Now, it's ended, uh, this, uh, the title of this last session is a summative session, but uh, it, it rapidly became clear to me that with some two dozen talks, most of which referred to a summary of work over a couple of decades or more, that meant I had one minute uh, to summarize each 20 years of research, and that was clearly impossible, so I am not going to do that. Um, rather, I want to look at some um, themes that go across, but before I do that, um, I would like to just start to say why the importance of this topic. As Clyde brought out very clearly in his introductory uh, paper, uh, it's not a new topic. Um, so why be bothered about it? Well, there are very good reasons for being bothered, uh, partly that the conceptualization in years gone by is really very different from the way it is thought about now, and that's partly a question uh, of better understanding, and it's partly a question of the availability of technologies that weren't available then. So. What is the background? Well, the background, I think, starts uh, with the recognition that some experiences have effects that persist for many years after that experience has come to an end. Therefore, there has to be an explanation as to what has gone on in the organism to carry that forward. So we're not talking uh, about transient effects. They're of interest in their own right, uh, but that's not what this has been about. Um, but the second point is the marked heterogeneity uh, in uh, response to all manner uh, of adversities. I know of no exceptions to that in either naturalistic studies or experimental studies, and that poses an interesting set of questions which I'll uh, come back to. CIFAR uh, emphasizes the crucial importance uh, of the practical value uh, of research, and so that adds a different dimension too. And uh, the concern also with the health and uh, other implications for pol policy and practice of the science. Uh, and that's a, a theme 
uh, which uh, again I, I will come back to. It's not that the emphasis is on research, which is narrowly applied now, uh, but it's not simply blue skies research that is not potentially useful for policy and practice. So, get the right slide. So, what, what are the aspects um, that are cross-cutting here? Well, I want to highlight uh, just nine ways um, before ending uh, by three, uh, by six um, ways in which there are major challenges uh, that remain. Um, now, what is the first cross-cutting theme? Well, a broad concept of social adversity. <coughs> so in the papers that we have heard, uh, these have dealt uh, with <coughs> uh, social inequality, uh, with abuse, uh, with neglect, uh, poverty and deprivation. Uh, and they've also dealt uh, with the effects of normal experiences. Uh, Janet Worker's work on uh, language would be an excellent human example of that. And uh, the approach throughout has been on the dynamic um, processes as they operate over the course of development. That's been uh, underlying virtually all the work, uh, although highlighted as a main theme in a smaller number. Now, the second um, uh, achievement, I think, um, is using across species and across domains comparisons. I won't go through the list, you can read them. It has been an astonishing array uh, of variation. And um, the, you might think, well, those are going to be really very different. Fruit flies to kindergartners, that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, but it wasn't ridiculous. Um, <coughs> the, there was a, um, these widely diverse species showed a surprising degree of comparability in social functions, despite major differences in detail. And epigenetic mechanisms uh, play a key role in the biological uh, embedding of those experiences. Uh, some similar mechanisms apply uh, to normal variations in behavior uh, as uh, also to abnormal experiences. And that's an issue I will come back to again because that has been a very important aspect uh, of the work. Now, the third achievement, I think, uh, or cross-cutting theme, uh, is the importance of developmental variations. Uh, social hierarchies uh, are least marked in childhood. They're more marked in infancy uh, and in later life. Uh, they also vary uh, according to uh, what domain you're looking at, so that uh, in um, Leah's presentation, uh, she contrasted, although she didn't draw attention to the contrast, uh, between the major early um, social inequalities in relation to language and the negligible ones in behavior. Uh, so we need to think about why it is working differently uh, with different domains. The importance uh, of childhood in the emergence of uh, emotion processing capacities and the effects of early experiences uh, on later uh, brain functioning. The mediating mechanisms are of course likely to vary with age and I won't go through uh, the ways in which this is likely to be the case because it's fairly obvious that we have to think about um, differences by age so that um, Michael Marmot's uh, work on the 
uh, Whitehall study has uh, been referred to several times and where the lack of control uh, has been a key mediating feature. Can that apply uh, to infants? Well, no, that's scarcely likely to be the explanation. Um, the outcomes, um, the environments in childhood also, uh, as we have heard, modify responsivity uh, to inflammatory stressors uh, in later life uh, as well uh, as the other way around. Now, the fourth uh, is curious to mention in this way, but the uncertainties, read really the causal inference, were brought out very nicely in Nancy Adler's uh, paper, uh, indicating not only the um, different possibilities, uh, reverse causation uh, and so forth, uh, but also the need to test uh, for um, causal mechanisms. And um, the, um, the importance in this, uh, she mentioned in passing, uh, but I would give particular emphasis to, the need for uh, natural experiments. Um, and the one fact that she got wrong um, as she knows, because I have discussed this uh, with her, is up on the slide saying <coughs> maternal smoking during the pregnancy uh, causes a much increased risk for ADHD uh, and antisocial behaviour. It does not. There are three natural experiments by three different groups of investigators using three different types of natural experiment, and they all show the same thing. That's to say, if you just simply look, the crude association, yes, there is one. You then introduce your usual control for confounders, and it comes slightly down, but only slightly. But then when you introduce the natural experiment, for example, uh, looking at um, contrast between two pregnancies of the same mother, uh, or the comparison using assisted conception design um, that Anita Thapper and Francis Rice devised uh, of looking at pregnancies um, in which there is a genetic link between mother and child, as there would be with sperm donations, and ones where there is no uh, genetic link, as with the donation of eggs. And what she found uh, with the maternal smoking is that you got the effect only where there was a genetic link. Uh, now, uh, there are many other examples of how natural experiments um, can uh, be very helpful, and uh, the use of um, animal models, uh, of course, does bring tremendous power uh, in being able to do this, so that, for example, uh, Russ Van Al's work and Michael Meany's both provide excellent examples of how your ability, uh, in Russ's uh, case, of inducing uh, changes in social hierarchy uh, gave you the power, as it were, to test uh, whether this really was having the causal effect. Michael's work uh, using cross-fostering design was able again to show that the effects on the offspring uh, were largely accounted for by the rearing and not by uh, the genetics. Uh, but then he used also uh, chemical modifications to test uh, whether it was actually uh, part uh, uh, mediated uh, uh, by um, epigenetic effects. Um, it's not quite so easy to do this sort of thing in humans, but um, you can do it. Um, so that the study that I would mention here would be the Zinc uh, et al. paper uh, from Andreas Meyer Lindenberg's lab uh, using a very neat uh, design um, of uh, a competition in which it is rigged so that you think you're dealing with a competitor of higher social status 
as against lower social status, and finding that the uh, neural effects were different uh, in the two cases. Uh, and of course, there is the uh, earlier work um, of the uh, Danny Weinberger uh, group uh, using uh, intermediate phenotypes uh, in order to uh, study um, gene environment interaction. Now, the next cross cutting theme is that the effects on maladaptation are not the same as those on reproductive fitness, and that in thinking about all of this, we need to bear in mind evolutionary uh, considerations. Um, in addition to those uh, that put up on the slide, um, several speakers brought out quite rightly that there is no single best normal phenotype. The idea of this is just an absurdity from a biological point of view. In the same way as um, Robert Hind emphasized, there is no such thing as adaptability considered without there being something to be adapting to. Um, and the research, uh, in a number of different ways, uh, uh, brought out uh, the importance of this. Uh, sex differences um, came up several times. Uh, it's only Don's paper at the end that focused exclusively uh, on these, uh, but sex differences uh, in both um, animal models and human studies uh, have been very striking. Um, and I think we really don't know um, very much uh, about what the mechanisms uh, that are involved are. Uh, but it is weird uh, that sex differences, which are pretty easy to observe, uh, have received so little serious attention. Uh, it, they are investigatable. Now, uh, the seventh point is understanding the neural basis uh, of brain plasticity. Kyle's Hench's uh, paper uh, dealt explicitly of this, and he explained very nicely uh, what uh, the concept meant, and also emphasized that from a developmental point of view, you need to have both plasticity and stability, so that the ability to switch on or switch off uh, um, critical periods uh, is a useful thing uh, to be able to do. Um, the evidence on plasticity comes mainly from animal models, uh, but there are considerable uh, human clinical implications uh, to be uh, considered. Now, the next one is the dynamic operation of gene environment interdependence. Um, in the human literature, some geneticists have um, expressed great skepticism as to whether gene environment interplay exists at all. Um, why is absolutely beyond my imagination, uh, but uh, they have. And um, in this colloquium, uh, the, uh, although gene environment interaction was not a major uh, focus, uh, it was considered uh, in instructive ways by going across species, by focusing on the biology, and by considering the implications of gene environment interdependence for an understanding uh, of uh, experiences and their biological uh, embedding. And I'll come back to that uh, presently. The last um, theme is the commitment to the implications for preventive interventions. And we certainly have some useful leads available, but considerable uncertainty on how to link those with the biological findings so that uh, both Ron Barr and Jack Shonkoff uh, in um, the session yesterday uh, brought out 
the problems and the fact that we should be concerned to do this, uh, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and so let me uh, contrast this with the situation in relation to uh, the withdrawal of many of the major drug companies, including GlaxoSmithKline, from any research into drugs for mental disorders. I mean, it's quite striking. Um, so why have they withdrawn? Well, because it wasn't working. That the, uh, There were Me Too drugs, i.e. variations on something already existing, and the hope indeed expectation, confident expectation, that the biological research would lead to new drugs did not happen. So we need to ask ourselves, can EBBD um, basic science research be different? Well, I think that um, there is some optimism, uh, partly because uh, of the breadth of approaches and by the ways in which the research has been forward-looking uh, and uh, concerned with the principles that may derive out of it. So it's not targeted on individual diseases um, and uh, nor indeed uh, do I think it should be. Now what I need to turn to now is the um, six uh, challenges. Um, the first challenge is conceptualizing, categorizing, and measuring the environment. W why is that a challenge? Well, uh, because it has actually proved so difficult. Uh, we had um, two uh, good examples of some of the ways forward uh, so that uh, Nancy Adler's uh, ladder approach to measuring uh, status um, was one that uh, Bruce mentioned in his talk, um, so that uh, she and her colleagues devised a ladder in which people were asked to say where they were on the social hierarchy, and uh, compared this with objective measures of the social status, occupation, education. And what is really interesting is that in uh, two separate studies, one naturalistic, one experimental, uh, the uh, health implications from the self-described effective environment rather than the so-called objective environment work much better. And uh, there was an imaging study which was referred to in one of the papers, I've forgotten which one now, uh, which showed that the neural effects of the self-rated social status uh, was evident, which was not found in the objective uh, measures. Well, it's early days on that, uh, and I'm sure Nan Nancy would not wish to claim that that's all wrapped up. But the point is that she has uh, focused on uh, the recognition that from the word go, infants process their experiences, and that's come up in several of the uh, papers. Um, and also that from very early on, uh, individuals shape and select environments. And if that is so, and I think there's very good evidence that it is so, then one must expect that that processing uh, needs to be um, a focus. Tom Boyce is the other example I'm giving, uh, in which uh, the very nice videos uh, of the ways in which um, social dominance was assessed, not by rating scales, uh, although they, those were used, uh, but in videos of interactions, and we saw uh, how vividly uh, there were differences uh, among individuals, as well uh, as um, social stratification in the group as a whole. So I won't go through the other things on the uh, slide, um, but 
what I would do is to suggest that the focus on environments um, which were rightly included in a rather broad way as the subjects of interest now need to turn to whether, for example, abuse and neglect have the same effects. Uh, if uh, the problem lies not in the experience of stress, but the absence of normal experiences, then maybe the uh, allostatic load concept, valuable though it undoubtedly is in many ways, may not be applicable there. I think it's not been studied, so we really don't know. And of course it is a problem that in the human situation, abuse and neglect tend to overlap. Uh, but still, it's an important distinction. Um, so let me uh, move on uh, to say a little bit more um, about um, the importance of the evocative effects of children's behavior in shaping adult behavior. Uh, that was mentioned in several papers, although it was not a major focus uh, in what was done. And we need to develop child-specific environmental uh, measures uh, that uh, can be applied in large uh, samples. The second challenge is the um, need to use research strategies that contest the environmental mediation causal hypothesis. And I won't go through uh, the examples I gave before on that, uh, but uh, there are so many examples where causal effects have been assumed where they're not there, or rather the association is there, but they don't represent environmentally mediated uh, causal effect. Uh, and that has to be a major topic to be taken up. Then the third challenge is the whoops, uh, need to understand better what epigenetic changes do and do not account for. So we have to ask which environmental changes bring about uh, epigenetic changes. Um, Possibly these may be only ones where there is a psychological or physiological impact, uh, but the point is that we need to ask which experiences they are. Will the epigenetic effects of neglect, abuse and social inequality all be the same? Uh, will the effects vary according to when the experiences occur? Will they vary according to the stage of brain development? Uh, will they occur even in adult life? We know that major experiences in adulthood can affect brain structure. Uh, the London taxi driver study is the one that sort of caught the public imagination, but there's actually much more research on that now. And so it's clear. Can epigenetics operate in the same way? And one of the things that several speakers emphasized is the very large confidence interval of many of the findings. Uh, and uh, so the phrase I like is the one that uh, Ed Ziegler uh, borrowed, I've forgotten who first invented it, of the tyranny of the mean. And what he meant by that is that in almost all research there is a focus on mean differences between two groups, totally ignoring the fact that the within-group variation is often bigger than the between-group difference. Uh, so let us also suppose all of that can be dealt with. Let, let us take the example uh, of institutional deprivation, such as the Roma Romanian adoptees that Chuck 
uh, studied and that we too have studied and Megan has studied. Uh, let us suppose uh, that that brings about epigenetic changes. It would be pretty astonishing if that weren't the case. Uh, but will the epigenetic differences account, from the, account for the huge heterogeneity in the response, even to a profoundly depriving environment like that? Uh, will they differ differentiate between sensitizing effects and um, uh, strengthening uh, or stealing effects. Um, that's not something we've actually talked about much uh, during this last two days. Um, but uh, Gick Levine, half a century ago, uh, did very neat studies uh, showing uh, the uh, stealing effects of physical stresses in, in rodents. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's the Hubel and Weasel work uh, looking uh, at a rather different sort of uh, experiences. Um, and we then have to say, well, let us suppose then there is an epigenetic effect. Let us suppose that epigenetic effect brings about changes in HPA functioning. We then have to say, well, in terms of looking at the consequences of this, does it work best to focus on the epigenetics or on the, or on the HPA axis or on something else? And we should not assume uh, that there can be only one level at which things need to be thought over. We need to look at multiple levels and uh, we should make no assumption as to which level will actually work best. Now, sorry, I've just been dealing with that. Um, so the fourth challenge is, uh, to what extent does neural uh, recovery uh, account uh, for functional recovery after brain damage? Now, that's not been something discussed, I think, uh, in the papers in this symposium. Um, but... Um, there are some very interesting findings and ideas led, I suppose, by Taub particularly, uh, who has used a therapeutic intervention where both with cerebral palsy children and with adults with acquired brain injury uh, in which the normal arm is immobilized and there is mass practice in the arm that didn't work, and finding in two randomized controlled trials that it actually had uh, beneficial effects. Now, the interest is not, so far as we're concerned, uh, on the brain damage that took place, because that's not what it's about. But the interest is, what happened with the mass practice? and does that have implications for the way we should think about psychosocial experiences? Uh, so that, well, probably nobody here did see, but there was an interesting TV program uh, done in Britain uh, about four severely handicapped soldiers uh, damaged in Afghanistan uh, uh, who uh, decided uh, to undergo training to walk to the North Pole. They had 160 miles to do. One of the people uh, had had a uh, spinal injury and was told uh, he'd be lucky to sit up again. He certainly would never walk. And he decided, stuff that. I am going to walk, and moreover, I'm going to walk normally. And he walked the 160 miles to the North Pole. Now, the question that, as a scientist, one has to focus on is, was that just, as it were, the mental feature uh, of determination and persistence? He undoubtedly had that. And of course, those mental features will have had biological connotations. But had that also introduced new neuronal growth or new synaptic connections. 
Uh, I don't know, uh, but it does matter. The um, fifth challenge, nearly out, um, is what are the um, implications um, of gene environment interdependence for an understanding of environmental influences and their biological uh, embedding. And here, um, the interest, I think, uh, of the G times E uh, work uh, is that if there is a interaction, and it has been shown in both animal models uh, and in uh, human studies umpteen times, the pathways for the genetic effects and the environmental effects must either be the same or very closely connected. And so it carries the potential for understanding the operation of the pathways in the environmental effect uh, as well as the genetic effect. Uh, now, in terms of the biological implications of all of this, um, the finding from a study uh, by Karg and his uh, colleagues, um, a large-scale uh, meta-analysis um, uh, looking across the effects of stress defined in various different ways uh, in relation to G times E, found that there was a marginally significant effect for acute life stresses, but a hugely significant effect uh, for maltreatment. Now, that's really interesting because you're getting the G times E uh, in relation to a hazard that was present in early childhood looking at an outcome in adult life, uh, a long-standing biological pathway. And um, Steve Sumi's work uh, provided a very elegant uh, demonstration of the ways in which uh, his rhesus monkey uh, studies uh, can test out some of the ideas uh, in this. And it's clear, I think, that this is a major uh, challenge that needs to be met. Now, the sixth and last you'll be glad to hear, uh, challenge, is um, in relation to prevention. Um, and good ideas for prevention have been expressed, but it remains unclear to me, at least, uh, whether uh, they are related at all to EBVD findings. Uh, so that what about the evidence a continuing brain growth into early adult life. How should that make us think about the issues? Uh, what about the evidence on brain plasticity? The fact that this is not something that stops in early childhood but goes on into adult life, although it diminishes. Uh, what about the evidence of the strengthening effects of coping with stress and challenge. For example, David Lyon's work um, uh, growing out of Gig Levine's lab uh, in the days when he was alive and in charge there and following up those ideas and with very uh, nice demonstration uh, how uh, brief stresses of a kind that were appropriate in the, in the wild environment uh, was, had both behavioral and neural effects uh, in later life. Uh, what about the evidence on the effects of uh, adult experiences on the brain? Uh, now, obviously, there is no easy way of taking all of that uh, and uh, devising a program of intervention. Uh, Ron uh, and Jack, to come back to their uh, papers, uh, clearly indicated the difficulties. Why am I nevertheless um, modestly optimistic that I think this is doable? Well, because of the style of the basic science research 
that we have heard over the last two days. And the ways in which it is being used not to find a treatment for schizophrenia or the cause of schizophrenia, to stick with schizophrenia, but rather principles that may apply more broadly and that we need to make use of in thinking how uh, we can have programs that do not just do good, uh, although of course I, like everyone else, is in favour of interventions of that kind, but ones in which we can make use of the neuroscience uh, to make programs that are going to be different in style uh, from those that are traditionally the case. Now the last slide is simply to say that the fact that I have listed nine uh, major achievements and only six challenges is carrying the explicit message of how much the EBBD program has achieved and I think it has been well illustrated in the fantastic set of papers that we have heard over this last two days and I'm sure that none of the speakers would disagree with my conclusion that there are challenges still to be met because they have already in describing their own work shown enthusiasm for taking up new challenges and finding good answers. And so let me end on that note.